I, I'm going to try to, uh, as briefly as I can, talk about some of the development um, issues um, regarding the, uh, the environment and the ecosystem um, and kind of walk you through some of those without uh, hopefully blowing the machine up here. Here we go. Okay. Um, so in general, uh, the, it, it's basically population growth and economic development, uh, obviously, that leads to the conversion of the natural environment. Um, increased competition for scarce natural resources. We see that particularly in, uh, locally at the moment in competition for water uh, between uh, uh, the needs of development, agriculture, um, and fish um, in terms of in-stream flow needs. Um, those development converts natural soils and the landscape and, and vegetation to buildings and infrastructure and uh, as well as the commercial resource extraction activities or what we call the natural resource lands of uh, ag forestry and mining all have some some sort of conversion of the natural environment some impact on them runoff um, and water quality degradation both due to the increase in those impervious surfaces as well as the activities on the land itself um, and finally, the loss of environmentally sensitive or what are called critical areas under the Growth Management Act, uh, and in particular, their functions and values. That is, the things that they do or they provide, and the new uh, way to think about those um, critical areas is as really as the green infrastructure. So they absorb stormwater, they filter um, stormwater uh, pollution, they absorb flood water, uh, they provide habitat and a whole range of, 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 of good things. Um, what tools do we have to mitigate um, those impacts? Well, there's no shortage of them. Um, there's, there's a bunch at the state and local level. There's the Growth Management Act, which I will focus my, um, my points on today. Uh, embedded in the GMA are critical area regulations, which are intended to protect the environment. Uh, there's also the Shoreline Management Act, which is uh, uh, focused specifically on uh, both freshwater and um, marine shorelines, uh, the 200 feet of those shorelines and the activities that go on within them. And then there's SEPA, the State Environmental Policy Act, uh, which we are, we are required to do uh, as the planning department on every, every project or every permit uh, proposal that comes across our desk. Uh, at the federal level, you know, starting back in the 1970s, there was the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act. Those all get filtered through state and local agencies as well, usually for implementation. Uh, and finally, really, uh, probably the most, um, the, the newest approach is the non-regulatory approach, uh, perhaps because the, the regulatory approaches haven't exactly been entirely successful. Uh, you see now a lot of incentive-based approaches or non-regulatory um, ways of going about it. So the federal and state programmatic grants for ecological restoration, land acquisition, uh, the CREP program. Uh, we at the, uh, at, at the county have a PDR or purchase of development rights program where we go out and buy, um, buy development rights on undeveloped land and a TDR program or a transfer of development rights where we can, we can facilitate the transfer of rights from one property that might, um, might have particular ecological value to another property that has less value. Uh, and then finally, the current use and open space taxation program, which allows folks that if they keep their land in open space and don't develop it, uh, they get a tax break out of that. So that's kind of the rubric. And, and, and of course, there are others as the HPAs and, 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 and um, forest conversion practices that are done by the DNR and the Fish and Wildlife um, that uh, go on in, in addition to these. So my point here, I guess, is that there's no shortage of programs that are already out there. Um, and you heard uh, Mayor Linville talk this morning about how quiet things were in Bellevue in 1950. Um, and she's right. I mean, a decade later in 1960, uh, the county was growing by an average of about 400 persons a year. Well, 50 years later, in 2010, that growth rate was about 2,500 persons per year. So, and we're not making any more land, obviously, but apparently we're making a lot more people because they keep coming here. And of course, they come here for all the reasons that folks have talked about how, um, what a great place it is to live. So growth management, really the rubric is, well, let's not, uh, you know, let's not tip over the apple cart there. And um, so a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of reliance goes into uh, uh, looking at the GMA as the, as the uh, kind of the silver bullet to solve these problems. 
Um, this slide is showing you the, uh, we just completed our, uh, our most recent 20 year um, comprehensive plan under the GMA. Uh, and it shows you the total um, uh, existing county population was about 206,000 folks. Uh, our, our projected 20 year growth for the next 20 years is almost 70,000 folks. So that's almost another Bellingham. Um, and I want to point your attention kind of down in the corner and in, in the lower right corner, uh, the um, the area that uh, uh, the urban growth areas or the UGAs were the area we were supposed to co um, concentrate our growth is allocated to accommodate about 84% um, of that future growth. And so only 16% of that growth would go into the rural areas. And the rural areas are primarily where uh, most of the remaining significant um, ecologically important lands um, are, are, are located. So I will talk a little bit later uh, about um, how that's how that's working. So a brief overview of the GMA. Um, it it came into being in 1990 primarily because of uh, concerns about the rate of growth uh, and about how it was outstripping uh, uh, government's ability to, to 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 pay for that growth as well as having uh, adverse impacts on on the natural environment. So it's intended to balance growth with environmental protection. It is intended, as it states, uh, to manage growth, not to stop growth. Uh, and the, those decisions are left to local governments. Uh, but its primary intent was to reduce sprawl and the cost of infrastructure or the cost of providing that infrastructure to, um, to cities and towns and counties. Uh, it does that primarily by encouraging more compact urban growth uh, and less rural growth. And uh, we will see that that, uh, that has been the case in Whatcom County. We've, we've been complying with that by uh, increasingly in the last two decades, accommodating more growth, uh, a greater share of growth in the urban areas and the cities and towns than we are in the rural areas. Uh, and of course, as I talked about with the critical areas, uh, protecting those areas, uh, as well as protecting the natural resource lands for their long-term commercial significance. And those are the agriculture lands, our forest lands, uh, and our mining lands. So how are we doing at mitigating the impacts uh, of that growth on the natural ecosystem? Uh, our, 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 the Puget Sound Partnership is a, is a state agency uh, that was created by the legislature um, some years ago uh, specifically to restore the health of Puget Sound. They have done the most in terms of monitoring um, the impact or the, or the health of the, uh, of the uh, sound. Uh, they've adopted 49 different vital signs, what they call vital signs, for measuring the health of Puget Sound. Uh, land development uh, and land cover is one of those 49 vital signs. And there are four indicators um, for that vital sign that I'm going to go over with you here. So the first one is forest loss. Um, the second one is riparian restoration. The third is, is growth in urban growth areas that I just talked about. Uh, and the fourth is the conversion of what they call ecologically important lands. So that, that first indicator of forest loss basically provides a check on the region's uh, success in uh, maintaining forest cover throughout Puget Sound. It tracks the conversion of uh, all kinds of mixed forest, uh, both uh, de deciduous and coniferous. Um, and they have set a 2020 uh, Puget Sound-wide target uh, to um, not exceed 1,000 acres per year uh, loss of forest land cover. Um, and that's measured based on satellite data. Uh, the status as of today on that, as reported um, by the partnership, um, is that they've been losing about, we lost 2,000 acres per year uh, between in, in the first five years of the decade, and then have that number uh, during the second five-year period. So that was good, a good sign uh, that that, tar although that target value has already been exceeded, at least the rate of which that conversion is happening has been significantly reduced. Uh, locally in Whatcom County, uh, we had the State uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife conduct what they call high resolution change detection project using um, high level photography and they were able to uh, uh, pin the, the loss of forest cover at about three acres, a little less than three acres per thousand per year in the county. 
of that amount, uh, only about a half an acre per thousand per year was actually due to development activity. So that's a relatively small number, and there were significantly higher numbers, of course, that either were natural um, stream meanders that actually uh, recruited large woody debris um, and took took canopy out and laid it down on the river, uh, or due to wind throw or due to um, forestry and logging, which of course is um, renewable. Um, so the second indicator that the partnership monitors on land development is um, riparian vegetation restoration. They've set up a, uh, a, a target of 200 and restoring about 270 miles of um, riparian vegetation um, Puget Sound wide. Uh, they've achieved, according to their data, achieved over half of that uh, already, half of that target. Uh, and just alone in Whatcom County, um, the Conservation District uh, and INSEE, the Nooksack Salmon Enhancement Association, are two of the primary drivers on um, on salmon on uh, habitat restoration. Uh, and so um, each of those has, has done a significant amount of work in terms of miles of streams restored and, and trees replanted. Uh, that uh, includes CREP, uh, but it doesn't include um, the critical area of permit uh, mitigation that our department um, monitors uh, as well. So those are additional acres that are required. If under the critical area regulations, you have to avoid impacts to those critical areas, particularly wetlands and, and stream and, and fish and wildlife habitat conservation areas. But if uh, some impact is uh, can't be avoided, uh, then mitigation is required. And so uh, we do have mitigation um, as well. Uh, the third column is conversion of ecologically important lands. Uh, this is something the State Fish and Wildlife and State Department of Ecology have been working on. They basically look at Puget Sound wide and county wide, particularly uh, high value, what they call high value e ecological lands. These tend to be uh, critical areas, um, wetlands and floodplains and, and um, stream corridors and riparian areas. Uh, and then they analyze the, the, the threat to those lands, the, the amount of pressure that they are subject to or development pressure that they are subject to. Uh, and then some have a higher value and some have a lower value. And so the goal of this is to encourage um, uh, protection of those lands that are especially subject to higher development pressures. Those could be in cities and towns, in UGAs, or adjacent to UGAs, or um, subject to particular uh, higher densities in rural areas. Uh, the target that the partnership has is to reduce that, um, that loss of vegetation cover uh, so that it doesn't exceed 0.15% uh, of the total area, total land area every five years. Uh, this is one of the, um, one of the indicators that they have found is actually losing ground. And that we were losing uh, more uh, land than, than, than was uh, targeted for conversion. Um, and this is an interesting one for us because when I talked about critical areas, we, we under the GMA and under the critical areas um, rubric, uh, critical areas are uh, protected on a permit by permit or parcel by parcel basis. So when someone comes in for a development permit that triggers the critical area ordinance review, that's what we look at, and we have to look at that parcel. Um, we don't take a wider view. We don't look at, well, gee, is that parcels, critical areas, how do they relate to um, the, the broader uh, uh, areas of conservation or, or the broader value that, that, that those uh, particular critical areas might provide in terms of, of habitat? Um, and and th that is a, just kind of one of the, the, the frailties of the law, or it's just kind of one of the realities of how the law gets applied. Um, and I'll come back to that when I, when I finish with the things that we are doing right now. Uh, the fourth and final indicator, as I talked about, um, on land development is the growth in urban growth areas. Uh, indicator tracks the proportion of that growth occurring uh, inside urban growth areas and outside urban growth areas. Um, the idea being that the more growth, the more compact growth we are, the more growth we, ch we, we can uh, channel into cities and towns where there is generally lesser, lesser value um, ecosystem habitat. Um, 
uh, then the better off we are to protect the higher value habitats that are out in the rural and the resource lands. Um, the target, Puget Sound wide, was um, for all communities and all counties to accommodate uh, at least 86.5% of their future growth um, within UGAs. Uh, or that's the target as of, the, f as of uh, the first 10 years of that from 2000 to 2010. Uh, that number was hitting at about 83%. This is, these are all the 12 P Puget Sound counties, uh, of which Whatcom is one. Uh, in Whatcom County, from 2000 to 2010, we accommodated 78% of our new growth um, within the UGAs. That's within the seven cities in the, uh, in, in the county, as well as Birch Bay uh, and Columbia Valley. Um, in our 2016 comp plan, we just adopted um, last year, uh, we're looking forward in the next 20 years, we're looking at, uh, we've allocated 84% of that future growth to occur uh, in the UGAs. And so that's that number I showed you at the beginning um, of, the, of the slides. Uh, so we're looking to up that, uh, up that share of urban growth into the future. And we've been doing that for the past two decades. Every decade has been an increasing, we've, see, we've seen a gradual uh, and not insignificant increase in the in 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 the share of urban growth in the county. Okay, so um, what are we doing uh, to reduce those ecosystem stressors? Well, the critical areas ordinance update uh, is our primary tool. As I talked about um, that review, we are required to do a mandatory periodic review and update every eight years under the Growth Management Act. Uh, we started that about three years ago and we're almost done. Um, council uh, should be holding a hearing here uh, probably in the next, uh, the next month or two uh, on that. So that's undergone a lot of scrutiny. Um, we had a technical advisory committee, a citizens advisory committee, then the planning commission, and now the council has gone through review of that uh, sort of line by line. So um, we have to balance efficiency uh, and fairness in applying those rules uh, as well as the best available science provisions which say these are, these are the things you should be doing to protect the environment and the ecosystem. So we intend to do, uh, once that gets adopted by council, uh, do a uh, uh, significant public education outreach effort uh, next year uh, to property owners uh, on those CAO requirements. Uh, and, and, you know, this is a great challenge really for local governments. We, we can pass as many regulations as we want, but if we don't uh, let people know what that means for them and if it applies to them or how it applies to them, um, they're not really very useful. And so uh, we are increasingly knowing that public education and outreach uh, are going to be uh, big challenges for us and things that we really need to focus on in the, uh, in the upcoming years. And it gets to, I think, what Ned was talking about with, with uh, really property stewardship. Um, we adopted, county adopted new stormwater regulations um, this, this year and last year. Uh, going back years with the uh, NPDES, uh, illicit discharge and detection and elimination program. Um, last year we adopted low impact development standards and, and tree retention standards in certain basins, certain watersheds. Um, that low impact development basically means that where you can, uh, where the soils allow, you have to do rainwater infiltration and try to get that water right back into the ground so it never leaves your property. Um, and so where soils allow, where the soils can absorb those, that, uh, that stormwater, um, you have to do that. Uh, so uh, that was a part of adopting also the Department of Ecology Stormwater Manual um, beyond just the cities and the NPEDES or urban growth areas into, into the rural areas. Um, as well as adopted um, just, I think, a week or two ago, we just adopted um, new impervious surface standards. So that limits uh, the amount of um, built environment that you can have uh, on certain parcels. Uh, county also adopted revised on-site septic system monitoring program. This, this requires on-site um, uh, monitoring and auditing of your uh, septic systems to make sure they're working correctly. Uh, the new 2017 ecosystem condition report uh, was just published by the Wildlife Advisory Committee. And that specifically recommended looking at critical area monitoring uh, and kind of this wider landscape-based approach to, um, to 
ecosystem conservation. So not just looking at it parcel by parcel, but kind of looking holistically. Are there are there really significant, ecologically significant areas that we should be looking at a different strategy to protect their functions and values um, than just on a parcel by parcel basis? Uh, we also study the natural resource marketplace approach, kind of the the. Uh, 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 trading, if you will, for are there agricultural benefits that could be provided on a farmer's field that would also provide watershed benefits. Uh, uh, and, and that is a, sort of an emerging uh, area of, of science. Uh, so that was an interesting study to kind of get us thinking about are there, again, other non-regulatory things we could be doing that would help facilitate ecosystem restoration and protection. I promise I've been told I have less than a minute and this is my last slide. So uh, we're working on climate change, uh, sustainability strategy that was in our new comprehensive plan that's scheduled to, to take that up next year. Um, Erica talked about the PIC program. We have the purchase of development rights and the open space programs that are ongoing. Uh, we are reviewing our transfer development rights program uh, right now to see if we could apply it to uh, lands that had particularly high uh, conservation value uh, and if that could be a criteria for transferring uh, lands into areas that had um, less conservation value. Uh, move that development from, from one area to to the next, and then our watershed management programs are ongoing. You know, we have a groundwater model to better understand, we're working on to better understand the relationship between surface water and groundwater. Uh, and we're looking at water supply and in-stream flow uh, improvement strategies and mitigation strategies. So that's all I got. You, t you talked about the uh, critical area updates are gonna have a hearing pretty soon. Yes. And that you would have an outreach after they're approved. So I wondered if you can, is there a way that there can be outreach before, like an executive summary kind of thing, so people know what the impact will be? Yes, there will be a public hearing. Uh, as I mentioned, this is, the, the review has been going on for about three years, and so that we've had um, lots of opportunity for public comment, and that's really what's, why it's taken so long, because everybody has had, had comments. Um, so there'll be a public hearing before the council in the next, I would guess in the next, within the next two months, and that'll be advertised. And then the, the, the draft, critical areas ordinance, the final draft, uh, as recommended by council, will be uh, published on the website, our, our plan department website. And so we will do some outreach to make sure that that legal notice gets out to a lot of folks. What I'm also asking is I've tried to wade through some of that language in, yeah. already, and I'm not doing very well. Yeah. So I'm wondering if there can be a... A little dumbed down, I yeah. use that word for myself, yeah, that's so good. I can understand it. That's a great question. Uh, we can we can definitely, we have tried to do, uh, uh, at certain milestones in the past, when it came out of the Planning Commission or when it came out of the uh, Technical Advisory Committee, some kind of brief summations, executive summaries of the major changes and how they, how they would apply. So that's a great suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. you. Yep. Uh, you touched briefly on the, the natural resources marketplace that the county's looking at. Can yeah. you elaborate just briefly on that? So that was a, uh, it was a grant funded project. Uh, 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 Heather Mackay is in the back of the room. She is the one to talk to uh, more specifically. Heather was our consultant on it, our lead. It was a, uh, a project that looked at um, this idea of trading uh, market-based approach as opposed to a regulatory approach. So are there things, uh, particularly in the agricultural areas, um, that farmers wanted, such as they wanted to get the water off, off the land sooner in the spring? Well, are there things that could be done to that would both benefit the farmer and benefit um, the watershed, the health of the watershed? So things like, oh, well, if, if we could have some um, surface impoundments of that water, for example, in certain places, it could get it off the farm fields, but also provide aquifer recharge. It could provide surface storage uh, or irrigation water. Um, it was looking at those kinds of things, and it was really a... a, a Oh, I don't want to say econometric, but it was a, a, a sort of a mathematical assessment of how would you just go about measuring the benefits uh, that you might get in ag for ag or for watershed improvements. And it kind of built the criteria or the infrastructure for how you would just measure whether something, if you, if you were to trade an act, one activity to get w another benefit, how would you measure that they were equal or who got, how do you measure the benefit? And so that's really a lot of what that groundwork that, that uh, Heather worked on did. So it, it, it's, it was kind of the first step 
in going down that road and what it what it told us was that man there's a lot of <laughs> a lot that goes into that uh, but there is an emerging um, sort of private conservation um, thinking going on um, and I think Renee talking about they have a private funder who is interested in helping with the diversion project and so there's more dollars coming in around the country uh, about what can we do to, to actually invest in green, green infrastructure uh, or in environmental preservation and, and so this the natural resources marketplace is one of the ideas about how to implement that. Uh, you mentioned that one of the objectives CAO is to maintain the quality of life. Can you explain how that is defined and whether it is a result of a local process? The maintaining the quality of life was really one of the goals of the Growth Management Act overall, of which the CAO was uh, one 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 piece. Um, that process, you know, just updating, that requires a comprehensive plan at every community, prepare a comprehensive plan and a set of development regulations to implement that comprehensive plan as well as a critical areas ordinance to, um, to um, protect the environment. Those are required to be by state law uh, reviewed and uh, updated every eight years. Um, we do a public, every community is also required by the GMA to make that is required to be a public process and that's, um, um, you know, part of why our eight-year comprehensive plan update took three years to do because uh, there was literally so much public involvement and so much public interest, which is a good thing. Um, it's a good problem, but it, it um, everybody got a voice in it and everybody got to be heard. And the Act itself, the Growth Management Act, has 14 goals um, ranging from environmental protection to the protection of, of uh, private property rights. So uh, it in is of itself, it's a balancing act uh, and it requires uh, local governments uh, and counties have a particular responsibility when it comes to projecting and allocating and approving future growth for all of the cities. Uh, it is the county's responsibility to do that. It's their obligation. And so we had a series of um, um, public uh, workshops, town halls, uh, met with uh, all of the representative elected officials of all the seven cities and the county met regularly over the course of a year to kind of develop those population projections uh, and eventually adopt allocations for all of the jurisdictions. Um, so it's, it's an extensive process um, and uh, no shortage of public involvement. It really is, 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 is uh, part of it.